So uh, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for uh, joining us th this evening after what has been a, a beautiful day. Um, I'm Nick Wareham. I'm the director of the Medical Research Council Epidemiology Unit here at the University of Cambridge. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce my colleagues, Kirsten Rennie and Rebecca Richards, who are going to give the, the substantive uh, talks this evening. Our topic this evening is how um, epidemiology, a topic that uh, everyone will have become very familiar with uh, across the last year, how that uh, has had to adapt to changes in, in how we can approach uh, participants in research, how we can recruit them and how we can keep in touch with them uh, throughout our research projects. So Paul, perhaps if I can get you to click on to the next slide. So this is an issue that's really been very salient across the last year, not only for uh, observational studies, but also trials. And many of the, the advances that uh, have been made have really enabled us to undertake very rapid studies, set them up very quickly, uh, and uh, recruit and retain participants, both in trials of things like vaccines, but also in observational studies as well. Next slide, please, Paul. And the, uh, the government has identified seven key areas of action of how we can build on the success of the past year in thinking about the, the future uh, of this type of science. And the one that we really want to focus on this evening, and we'll also give you examples of how uh, studies have been set up much more quickly and more efficiently, but what we want to focus on this evening is how we can uh, build upon the digital platforms that have now been established to deliver clinical research better in the future. So throughout the course of this evening, we will have the opportunity for you to ask questions. There's a chat function at the bottom uh, of your uh, slides, and you can use that uh, throughout the course of uh, the presentations and we'll inter uh, intersperse questions where we can. But there are also various poll questions. And perhaps, Paul, if we could start with the first one. Uh, the first one is to try and get a sense of who it is who's joined us this evening. So perhaps if you could all answer this question about where in the world you are joining us from. See, everyone's quick on the draw. Ah, so we do have some people from around the world. Okay, thanks very much for that. Could you possibly end that, Paul? So most from Cambridge, but uh, some elsewhere in the UK and some further afield. Thanks very much. And the second question is about uh, your background of what's brought you to attend uh, the meeting this evening. So could you launch the second one, Paul? So why are you interested in our topic for this evening's talk? Take slightly longer to read all the responses. I think that's probably everyone nearly much 17 out of those. Okay, Paul, do you want to end that one? So a lot of um, researchers, obviously, public health professionals and interested people, which is a good thing. So um, we'll be returning to the polls um, later in, in the session, but perhaps if we can stop sharing that slide and switch to the, the second one. It's a pleasure to introduce Kirsten Rennie, who's a senior research associate um, in the MRC epidemiology unit. And, and uh, Kirsten is going to speak uh, about some challenges involving people in telehealth research uh, with an example of, of uh, a study set up during the, the COVID pandemic. So Kirsten. Thank you. So th um, in this session, I'm going to describe what we've done to change the process of how we've conducted research as the result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Changing our research to be completely 100% remote, conducting in people's own homes. And we're really interested through this session to hear your opinions and perspectives in the poll questions that are about to come up and at the end in the Q&A session about how we can work in our telehealth approaches in studies. 
So the first poll. Okay, so I'll just give you a few moments to answer that. And last few people. Okay, that's great. So I think overall there, a lot of people have said um, about two thirds about completing research on a computer tablet or smartphone and 21% on a smartphone app and 11% by telephone. Interestingly there, nobody has gone for visiting a study center. Okay, and the second question, please, Paul. Okay, so this is thinking about the main barriers to taking part in these telehealth research studies, what you think might be for yourself, um, the barrier. Interesting watching the bars go up and down between lack of time, lack of confidence with technology, access to technology and data security. So I think that's most people that have voted there now. So overall, over half the people think lack of time is the main factor of taking as the barrier to taking part with uh, data security as the second reason, followed by lack of confidence with technology points we definitely will be discussing today. Thank you. Okay. So the I wanted to start with what the Fenland study is about. So the Fenland study is not new. It's a cohort of around 12 and a half thousand participants who were recruited across Cambridge here, who were born between 1950 and 1975. And the Fenland COVID was set up to primarily investigate the interaction between environmental and genetic factors in the development of obesity, type two diabetes and other such uh, diseases. And what's really great about the Fenland cohort is that we collect detailed collection of information about health and lifestyle of the participants. And that includes objective measurements that we take, for example, accelerometry to measure people's physical activity. So in the first phase of the study, there were 12 and a half thousand participants who took part and they were re-invited back for a second round of measurements starting in September, 2014, and around 8,000 participants took part. Unfortunately, this phase two of fieldwork had to be halted rather abruptly last year at the start of the lockdown due to the COVID pandemic. So we felt that the Fenland study really could contribute to the broader UK research effort in a number of ways. We started planning the study in early April, 2020 and launched in July when the first lockdown was easing around the country. And we have to think back at that time, COVID testing in the first wave was limited to those individuals who had symptoms, who were admitted to hospital or healthcare workers. So the full extent of the infection rates, including people who were symptomatic and those who showed no symptoms, asymptomatic, was unknown. And estimates at the time varied enormously from 10 to 1,000 times the official statistics. And the extent of the presence of, of antibodies for COVID-19 infection were completely unknown. So in line as well with the overall aims of the Finland study. We also wanted to measure the effect of the national restrictions, including social distancing on health related behaviors, such as diet, physical activity, as well as body weight and well-being during this period. And a real concern was and still is that people are infectious before they develop symptoms in what we call the pre-symptomatic phase. And we wanted to investigate whether there were ways of identifying new cases of infection using digital measurements. And I'll come back to that later in the talk. 
So we plan the study to be initially six months long um, with the ability to extend it to 12 months depending on the pandemic and infection rates. And this diagram shows the measurements in relation to the first two objectives that I outlined just now. So participants were recruited between July and early November last year, and that's where we've got the baseline, where we took a blood sample to be able to assess COVID-19 antibodies. We asked participants to complete some questions on diet and physical activity and report their weight. And we then repeated that three months later and six months later. And we're currently finishing off um, the month six measurements now. We also ask people every month to complete a questionnaire about COVID-19, which includes various questions on symptoms, completing tests, and later on vaccines, and also to report their body weight. And alongside this, we have COVID-19 antigen test results from Public Health England that we can link to these measurements. So what did we need to change for this study? Well, usually people who are part of the Fenman cohort come to one of our clinical facilities across Cambridgeshire for a clinic visit where they complete measurements, a blood samples taken, and it gives the opportunity for participants to ask questions. And this face-to-face -face aspect to the study was so impo important in the study visits and was not possible in the last year. So to start with, I want to talk about blood samples. So just to warn people, and I'm now going to be talking about those. So our first challenge was how do you collect a sample to assess COVID-19 antibody status? And the conditions we faced last April when we were setting this study up, we had to explore the options for obtaining a blood sample at home. It was not possible to ask people to go to a clinical facility or to send someone to their home in full PPE to take a blood sample. So we had three options, the lateral flow test, a finger prick test, or a new device, which we'll talk about later called the one draw. The lateral flow tests, when we think back to March, April last year, were really in their infancy, and there are question marks over both um, their accuracy and people's interpretation of the results. The test results are not always clear, and sometimes there's a very faint line which is open to interpretation. And we did not want people to change their behavior due to the test result. It was not known at all at that point how long antibodies lasted for, what protections antibodies would provide, or the rates of reinfection. So we considered two options, a finger prick test in the top right, where someone uses a lancet to prick their finger and drops the blood onto a filter paper, or a new device called OneDraw, the one in the bottom right. Our choice was based on what was the most acceptable for participants to do in their own home, how easy and safe it was to return to the lab, and to give us a stable, standardized blood sample so we could reliably assess COVID antibodies. So firstly, we decided that a dried blood spot collected on a special filter paper was the best mode of collection so that it could be safely returned to the lab via the postal system as no liquids were involved. We decided to use the one draw device with a finger prick test as the backup plan. And now this device is pressed against the skin, as you see in the top right, and a button is pressed, which creates a vacuum. So it attaches the device to the skin and doesn't need to be held in place. Then a second button is pressed, which releases two small lancets that pierce the skin. Many who have undergone this test describe these lancets as feeling like an elastic band pinging against the skin. And then the device collects about three drops of blood in the strips of filter paper at the bottom. And then the filter paper cartridge is removed and inserted into a specialized transport sleeve. So it can then be easily transported back to the lab. Now the one draw device had up to that point only been used by healthcare professionals in a clinical setting for HbA1c testing, which is a long-term blood glucose test. So we had to apply for a dispensation from the MHRA for a limited change from the license to use at home by a non-healthcare professional specifically for this study. And we also had to consider how someone living alone could take a sample as on the arm to see the device and press the buttons, it really requires two people. So we chose a thigh site and tested the best position to get a sample reliably. 
It's important to remember that using dried blood spot technology is far from new. Recently, the NHS celebrated the 50 year anniversary of the dried blood spot Guthrie cards in newborn babies to test for PKU. And this technology now tests for nine rare diseases in newborns in that hill prick test. And it's been used widely for testing for infectious diseases such as hepatitis C, HIV and malaria. So the question for us is whether we could use this technology to extract antibodies for serological testing to determine COVID-19 infection. And we partnered with Omega and Melogic to look into this. So before we can even start the Fenland COVID study, we needed to answer some questions on using this device. How easy it was for participants to use in their own home following our instructions. If the device was acceptable for patients in terms of discomfort and pain, how stable the blood sample was when it was posted, and then how the one draw dry blood spot sample interface with the antibody assay, because the antibody assay was actually designed uh, primarily for use with a venous blood sample. So we needed to check that too. So I want to draw an analogy here with um, building from an IKEA flat pack because we all approach instructions in a different way. Some people like the written instructions on the left, others follow instructions more visually, such as a YouTube video, and others prefer the instructions verbally. And this is exactly the same in a study when you're working remotely, is finding ways to give those instructions in different ways. We couldn't demonstrate in person how to use the device, but we developed written instructions with detailed illustrations and online videos for both using the device on the arm and on the thigh. And we also had a telephone helpline for those people who preferred to talk through issues they were having with the device. So to answer the first three questions, we had a feasibility study uh, where we asked people to use the device and follow the instructions we had given them. So overall, 92% of participants successfully achieved a blood sample at the arm site and 90% at the thigh. And what was great about the study was participants gave us some excellent feedback on the instructions so that we could refine, improve the diagrams in the printed instructions and the information in the videos. And we were pleased that participants also reported low pain scores. Um, the median was one, so around one or two on a scale of one to 10. And then a subgroup of those participants also came into the clinic to complete three blood samples um, and administered venous blood test on the left, a finger prick test, and the one draw test. And in these people, 76% preferred the one draw device and found it less painful than both the venous and the finger prick tests. And this also allowed us to test whether the one draw sample collected at home and posted back to the lab was as stable as the one collected in the clinic under standardized conditions. So we were pleased to see all were adequate for analysis and we got identical results from those done at home and those done in the clinic. So the remaining question was whether the antibody assay that had been designed primarily for use with a venous blood sample worked the same with the dry blood spot sample or did the method need adjusting? So we had a validation study that was called CARVA, where 120 participants agreed to take part and came to the clinical facility earlier this year. And as in the earlier study, they all had a venous blood test, a finger prick test and the one draw test. And as you can see here on the right, there was a near agreement between the venous blood test, the serum, and the one draw dry blood spot test. And this gave us confidence that the assay method would not need adjustment and could be applied to the Fenland study. So in the Fenland study, oh, just over 4,000 people agreed to take part in the COVID-19 study. And of these, 89% of participants successfully used the device the first time. And overall, of the 4,000 people, 91% returned a successful baseline sample to the lab. And of these, only two of the samples were not able to be processed in the lab. So a very high success rate um, overall. Now today I'm presenting the initial results 
and they're not published or peer reviewed. This is from Baseline. So this is from July, November last year. And these are unadjusted prevalence levels. Um, and what you see there in the positive, in the dark blue, is 6% of participants um, were tested as positive for COVID-19 antibodies. And this is in line with other European population-based studies that were conducted in the same period last year. And you'll notice there are light blue, 7% of people were categorized as being indeterminate. And these are people, these are uh, tests that were at the margins of the thresholds between being clear negative or clear positive. And this is to be expected. There's no definitive antibody test that gives a clear binary positive negative result. So we do expect a proportion of people to fall into this category. And it could be that these people have had a recent infection within 21 days or a very mild infection. So their antibody levels are not sufficiently high to give a clear positive test. Alternatively, it could be that their antibody levels are declining following an infection um, between three months or eight months um, after an infection, but it varies enormously between individuals. So it's only when we, we repeat these antibody tests at month three and at month six that we can determine which of these two scenarios may be the case. So if we repeat and it's negative or positive, we'll know um, together with the other information we collect from participants why these were indeterminate. So we're now finalizing the three month results and waiting for the last of the six month blood samples to come in because of course we're very interested to see the impact of the second wave of the pandemic on the prevalence of antibodies in this population. And we're also collecting information on vaccines because, of course, uh, they need to be taken into account as well. Kirsty, maybe before you move on to the next session, we, we have a, a quick question in the chat about, could you say a little bit more about the demographic characteristics of the participants? Yeah, they're broadly, um, so of course, they're all uh, their dates of birth between 1950 and 1975. So it's a specific group in that sense, in age group. Um, but they were broadly similar to the, um, the uh, original Finland cohort. So the 4,000 of the 12,000, um, there's no real difference in men and women and age group from those. And we know that the Fenland main cohort is broadly representative of Cambridgeshire. Of course, some people have moved out of Cambridgeshire during that period um, to all sorts of places. Thanks very much. And if anybody has any further questions, you know, please use the chat and we'll intersperse them. But I think Kirsten's going to move on to talk now about collecting different types of data from participants. Yeah. So as I said earlier on, um, we had a humor apt substudy um, where we specifically wanted to look at whether we can improve the detection of that early pre-symptomatic. And that's the orange box you see at the bottom there. So that's when um, people are in, have got the infection, they're infectious, but they're not showing overt symptoms. And so that means that people are able to infect others. So we were interested, well, we are interested to explore if a combination of measurements um, that would be easy for people to take at home could identify that crucial pre-symptomatic period. So we partnered with Huma to develop a bespoke app. Um, you see an example there on the right-hand side and asked participants to take measurements three times a week. We provided them with a thermometer and a um, pulse oximeter to measure their oxygen saturation, which they entered into the app. And in addition to that, the, by using the camera on the smartphone for one minute, you were able to get a resting heart rate measurement, which also um, entered into the app. And we asked people to do this first thing in the morning, three times a week together with entering any symptoms that they're experiencing. We've had a great response to the app study. We're nearly two thirds of the participants who agreed to take in Fenland COVID taking part in the app sub study. And it creates a lot of data. So you'll see there on the right hand side, we're coming up to, um, well, we're over half a million measurements taken. 
and uh, not unexpected. The ones that we're asking people to do three times a week are the um, ones that you see there on the right hand side, the oxygen saturation, temperature and resting heart rate. And then we also get them to record other things, other questionnaires in there. And this bespoke app has gone under a few reiterations during the period of the study because we've had community testing introduced. So we needed to get, be able for people to register when they've had a test. And also more recently with the vaccine rollout to make sure that we capture all that information. Uh, this again is unpublished results that came literally off yesterday, looking at the app engagement over the study. And the beginning um, September and October, the, that was the time when people were onboarding onto the app, so coming on first of all and completing the baseline measurements. So by the end of October, most people were fully enrolled on the study. And you can see here quite consistent lines going across to last week when we um, we're on this graph. And the orange line is the average number of what we call modules per user. So that's measurements or questionnaires they complete per week, which is between 10 and 11. And so that would be a mix of those measurements, those symptoms and um, temperature and so on, and prompted questionnaires we ask them across the period. But what is pleasing to see is that yellow line at the bottom, which is the lowest 25% in terms of engagement, still being consistent at seven and a half modules a week. So it gives us confidence that engagement has continued throughout with a nice little blip um, in early January, because that was the time when uh, we communicated a lot more with the participants and also there was a lot more from the government at that point. And just quickly looking at the weekly measurements. So these are the ones we ask people to do three times a week. And you can see here that the average was above 2.5 times for most of these measurements. So the majority of people were completing it as we hoped. It's a bit low of the symptom tracker, but that's to be expected because not anybody collects that they have none, no symptoms each, each time. So, I think there are quite a few considerations and things that we've certainly learned during this for telehealth research studies. And one is how do we increase inclusivity in recruitment? And how do we ensure people with lower technology literacy take part? Um, one of the barriers identified really is technology literacy changing as a result of the pandemic and necessity for us to use online banking, shopping and for communication. Um, what we certainly have seen that any platform that's used has to be compatible with the devices people have. Not everyone has the latest smartphone, the latest iPhone. It has to be compatible right across the range. Um, and as people noted earlier on about data security and privacy, that's something we've really had to spend a lot of time on. We have to check all data security and privacy terms very carefully as a research organization collaborating with private companies. We need to check it all complies with how we handle people's study data within the university and it, it, it complies with that in terms of how the data is transferred, stored, and that only those who need to have access to such data. And I know Rebecca will be talking about that much more in the following slides. I've learned personally a lot about technical issues and troubleshooting, and we have had to develop quite a few how-to guides on how to do things like taking your heart rate on the camera, how to um, download the app, and, and so on. And the firmware where they updates on devices are pretty much continuous. So, <laughs> so constantly needing to keep an eye on those and fix bugs um, and update the app. Um, something I didn't envisage before we started. So I'm going to leave this really open before I just close, which is, I think COVID has obviously been a major upheaval and it's driven the change to being online, perhaps accelerated and given us an opportunity perhaps to change how we think about, we conduct research. But what perhaps we're less clear on has the perception of people changed alongside this. Are people more accepting of these technologies and more happy to take part in remote research studies? Or are we at the end of this more fatigued and wanting face-to-face -face contact again? 
Do we engage better if we're asked shorter questions more frequently on an app rather than coming to a research facility and completing all the questions there? And we really would look forward to hearing your views on this in the Q&A session. I just want to close with thanking everybody. We're extremely grateful to all those people who have volunteered to be part of these studies, the validation feasibility, as well as the Fenland COVID. Um, and the size of the font, I think, just illustrates how many people have been, been involved in setting up and running of this study and all the testing. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Kirsty. I think in the interest of time, we'll move straight on uh, and I'll introduce uh, Rebecca Richards, who's a research associate in our prevention team. And she's going to segue from talking about taking blood and collecting information to the challenging topic of delivering interventions at a distance. So, Rebecca. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, OK, is everyone able to hear me OK? OK, so yes, um, yes I'm uh, Rebecca Richards. I'm a health psychologist and postdoctoral research associate um, at the MSC Epidemiology Unit. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how we conducted a study of an online weight management program during the pandemic um, and the challenges that we came up against in terms of reaching the intended target users um, and, and engagement in the program and what this really means for potentially scaling up this type of program in the future. So we all remember the impact of lockdown one when our leisure centres closed and we were limited with outdoor exercise and so on. And there was a general public discourse about how we were exercising less, eating more and generally feeling a bit anxious. So thinking back to the first lockdown around April, May last year, how did it affect your health behaviours and mental health? Um, so let's see if we can um, get a poll up on the screen here and we can um, have a look at how we all fared in lockdown one. Um, and the idea is that I will then share with you um, findings from a survey conducted by researchers at the University of Liverpool who um, examined um, a cohort of 2000 adults and, and looked at the impact of, of the lockdowns on their, on the, their health behaviours. Okay, so yeah, around half, 60% uh, snack more, but, uh, just under half may be the same. Um, yeah, and then over three quarters of us um, spent more time sitting. And then what about mental health? Um, okay, so under half felt worse or the same, and uh, some of us felt a bit better. So a mix there, but generally um, more in the uh, negative direction, I think. OK, so. So, like I said, researchers um, from the University of Liverpool conducted a survey of um, 2002 adults to look at how lockdown had affected health behaviours. And um, the BMI was largely um, representative of, of the UK, where 57% of the sample were overweight or living with obesity, so a BMI of over 25. So unsurprisingly, um, over half reported that they had snacked more during lockdown compared to before and almost three quarters, um, so very similar to the results we just saw in the poll, um, reported um, experiencing um, sitting, spending more time sitting down and then um, over half um, of adults reported that they were feeling more anxious. Um, and within this study, the researchers also found that adults with a higher BMI were more likely to report a lower quality of diet, um, lower physical activity levels, and increased overeating compared to those with a lower BMI. Um, and they also reported feeling more out of control around food as well. So the researchers concluded that adults of a higher BMI may be most at risk of increased weight gain as a result of lockdowns um, and the restrictions. So we had then a large proportion of the population who may have been struggling with uh, weight management. And of course, many weight management programs such as Weight Watchers or NHS programs um, were disrupted and put on hold. And at this time, um, we at the MRC Epidemiology Unit had been due to launch a study um, of a weight management program that aims to help adults with weight loss maintenance. Um, but this was also put on hold due to COVID. 
So we edited and reorganized the content of our program um, so that we could turn it into a new program, essentially, that aimed to um, help adults with a higher BMI to prevent weight gain during lockdown. And we call this new program Swim C, so supporting weight management during COVID. And we managed to get ethical approval um, for a randomized controlled trial of Swim C at the end of April. Um, so it was an incredibly fast turnaround, thanks to um, our wonderful team. So SWIMC um, is a behavioral weight management program um, based on acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a newer type of psychological therapy that is known to support weight management. The program consists of an online website that includes 12 sessions where participants work through um, a session weekly. And there's some light touch support from a non-specialist coach built in to support them through the program. And in the swim sea trial, um, participants were randomly allocated to either the swim program or a weightless control group. Um, and those in the weightless control group received a leaflet containing standard advice for people with a high BMI um, to manage their weight during lockdown. Uh, but once they finished the study, then they, they gained access to the online website. And the aim of this trial was to find out whether swim C, um, whether the swim C program reduces weight gain over four months compared to the standard advice group. So here is an outline of the 12 sessions that we included in the program. And as you can see, um, we've included uh, sessions on the most important um, factors in weight management. So um, things like planning and tracking, problem solving for obstacles and dealing with cravings. We've also included the core components of acceptance and commitment therapy, which you can see here on the right. Um, so one of the reasons that ACT is thought to help with weight management is that it encourages the acceptance and tolerance of uncomfortable internal experiences. So things like food cravings and physical discomfort from exercise. And it does so using techniques and strategy and, and skills such as cognitive diffusion. The website platform that you can see for SwimC um, was designed to be very simple and easy to navigate. And you can see here that the weekly sessions run down the middle of the website in a journey-like format. And each session um, is structured in the same way and includes a range of behavioral and psychological exercises. We worked extensively with a graphic designer to create uh, really bright and engaging visual images. And we decided to go with cartoon-like images because these are very popular on mainstream apps that use psychological programs. Um, so for example, Headspace, um, but also because we could keep um, the characters gender neutral and not have to include a human shaped body, which might cause distress or stigma for some people. Like I mentioned earlier, the participants have contact with a non-specialist coach, um, which is in the form of telephone support after session four and an email check-in later on um, following session 10. And the role of the coach is really to increase participants' engagement with the program and to troubleshoot any issues that they may have, and generally to help them to understand and talk through some of the content or exercises if needed. Um, so the role really wasn't to give any specific weight management advice outside of the remit of the program. So once we had our new Swim C program up and running, uh, we aim to recruit 360 adults and randomly allocated half to the swim group and half to the standard advice group. And at the beginning of the study and four months later, we asked all participants to complete questionnaires online so that we could collect the data that we needed. And a subset of the swim C group um, was then invited to uh, take part in interviews once they had completed the program. The main outcome that we were interested in was whether swim C prevents weight gain over four months compared to current standard advice. Uh, but because we had to conduct this study online, um, we of course had to rely on participants self weighing at home and recording their weights for us. So to make this process as reliable um, and as accurate as possible, we sent them a list of instructions on how to weigh themselves correctly. And we also wanted to examine whether SWIMC improved eating behaviors, physical activity, mental health, and well being. Um, and in order to assess whether the program is more or less effective, perhaps for certain groups of the population, uh, we plan to explore if the effects of SWIMC differ by age, gender, educational level, and baseline BMI. 
So we started recruiting for participants in June last year. And because we were conducting this study um, online and, and under a lot of time pressure, we had to recruit from a previous weight management trial that we had run in the unit. Um, but we also reached out to um, obesity networks such as Obesity UK um, for, for wider reach. And in the hope of reaching a more varied sample within the time um, that we had, we also recruited from participants using social media. Um, and we managed to hit our recruitment target by September uh, with under four months later, which was great. And data collection then closed in February this year, which means that we are now currently analyzing our findings. So on to data management. So our data management and IT teams within the unit worked incredibly hard to put the systems in place that we needed to conduct this type of research remotely and online. Um, for example, they built a new secure research drive for us to work from from scratch um, to ensure that the data was safe and secure. They created electronic consent forms that we could consent participants into the study and we were provided with a secure email so that we could contact participants. We also use an online booking system called EasyBook so that we could schedule the participant phone calls um, with the coach. And we also use software um, called CloudPhone so that we could call participants um, safely and securely uh, using our own mobile devices at home. Um, so that's a very brief summary of um, some of the procedures and, and systems that the teams set up, um, but by be, no, be under no illusion that um, this was very complex and, and a hard task to achieve, so excellent work. Okay, so uh, let's see who we managed to recruit into our study and whether they found it engaging. So unsurprisingly, uh, our sample consisted of mainly uh, middle-aged to older, highly educated uh, white women with a BMI of 35. And this, is general, this generally reflects the samples included in most research on digital health interventions and specifically for weight management. And this is an issue in this type of research because there are, there are already known health inequalities in overweight and obesity. And so if our interventions and studies are not included in the, hard, uh, the harder to reach groups, we are risking um, exacerbating these existing health inequalities. So what could we do to increase our reach for next time? Well, uh, there are a few things that we can look at. For example, we could reach out to community champions, so leaders from community or religious groups to help us to recruit particular populations. Uh, we could explore how to make the program as culturally and contextually relevant as possible for, for the groups that we're trying to, to recruit. We could also make efforts to include family and friends in the recruitment process, um, which could also help us to re recruit relatives who may not have access to a computer or mobile device. Um, so there are lots of things that, that we can look at um, when restrictions allow. Generally, the engagement um, in the SWIMSEA program, so once participants were into the study and had um, got onto the website via a computer or app, um, the engagement was pretty good, um, particularly given that this was during um, a pandemic and, and during the sort of first lockdown. Um, so 97% of participants who enrolled in the study started the program. Um, with 82% um, completing up to session four and 87% completing their telephone call with their coach. Just under uh, half completed uh, up, to, up to session eight. Um, and if participants get to this point, they are generally considered to be completers of the programme. Um, after this point, we do see a continuing decline in engagement where 42% uh, uh, finished up to session 10 and finally 32% of the total sample completed all sessions. Um, now this level of engagement declining um, over the course of the program is a typical pattern of engagement in digital health interventions um, but nevertheless this is still um, a pretty good result all things considered um, and also 81% um, actually of all participants completed our follow-up questionnaires online in full for data collection, which is a really good um, retention rate for this uh, type of study. So while we haven't yet um, analyzed the, fully analyzed the qualitative interview findings from our study, we do have some pre preliminary insights into the challenges of engagement in the SWIMC program. 
for example, some participants um, explained, uh, and this actually uh, I noticed maps onto um, Kirsten's um, poll at the, that we did at the start. Some participants explained how they were still busy with work and their personal lives, and you know things have been quite hectic um, during the pandemic, and this meant that there wasn't always time to log on and do the swim sessions each week. Um, some people experience technical or website issues, um, which are particularly common during the first trial of an online intervention, so that is to be expected. Um, and in terms of content, some participants um, prefer the more psychological um, side of the programme, so for example, the sessions on emotional eating and, and learning about cognitive diffusion techniques, whereas others prefer the more behavioural um, side of the intervention, so they enjoy the sessions on goal setting and planning and tracking and those sorts of things. So there may need to be um, in future, perhaps a look at more personalization of the program. Finally, um, and, and again, unsurprisingly, many participants um, would have liked more contact with the coach and more support from them, um, as they explained how the human element of an online program is really important for them, particularly during a pandemic where, you know, we are really socially isolated um, and participants tended to much more prefer the telephone contact um, over the email contact. So overall, the SwimSea program was found to be very acceptable. Participants generally reported that um, despite some of the technical issues, it was very easy to use and they found the images to be engaging. Many also reported that they had achieved what they'd set out to do and they'd lost some weight during a really challenging time where the opportunity to gain weight was arguably greater than usual. And this particular quote on the right um, seemed to really sum up the ethos of the SWIM program. Um, and uh, so it was great to see that the aim of the programme was really uh, coming across to some participants. So they said, you know, SwimC looked at all those issues um, that other weight management programmes didn't address. Um, you know, it's not about the weight loss, it's about the whole rest of your life, your feelings, your emotions, all of these things that are important with regards to your health and well-being. I think everybody should have uh, this app on their phones. So uh, I love that quote. Okay, so finally, you know, could we scale this program up? Well, while an online digital weight management intervention like this in theory is scalable, we do have more work to do in terms of making this as inclusive and engaging as possible to make sure that we don't exacerbate existing inequalities in obesity. Next month, we'll be launching the original swim maintenance feasibility study, which aims to support adults who have already lost weight uh, to maintain it over the long term. So we will use this opportunity um, in this feasibility study to further examine the inclusivity and engagement of the program and whether it's cost effective in order for it to be potentially scaled up and rolled out in the future. And we've already made some changes to this program based on the findings of the swim C study. For example, we've added in more coach support to increase engagement. And um, since, since now we've been able to recruit a coach to help us deliver the study, so we have more capacity. And we'll also recruit participants with support from healthcare professionals to increase inclusivity. So hopefully we'll see um, a real positive change in engagement going forward. A huge thank you to our teams of um, star scientists and study support teams and our, our swim coaches who all worked incredibly hard during a very challenging time last year. And I also want to thank the wider teams that were involved, as well as um, like the data management, um, IT teams and research governance, as well as our patient and public involvement and stakeholder groups who really have fed in and guided our decision making throughout this whole process. Thank you to our communications team, namely Paul Brown for helping us to, to recruit participants online and navigate um, that particular issue. And finally, a big thank you to our funders, NIHR and EASO for supporting this study. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, we have opportunity now for a few minutes of uh, question and answer and the chat functions open if you want to use that. And while you're um, uh, thinking of possible questions, I'll go to one that came in uh, from Simon Griffin, um, which was addressed to Rebecca. Um, to what extent do you think that the uh, acceptance and commitment therapy depends on human contact and relationship building with a therapist? And can this really be replicated by a computer, tablet or website? Well, that's a great question. Um, so there, there's quite a few sort of early phase studies looking at um, 
delivering um, what's called third wave CBT, which encompasses acceptance and commitment therapy um, using digital health interventions. And so far, the results have been very promising. And if we look to older studies that um, have looked at delivering um, a more traditional therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy online, um, the results are actually very good. Um, so, I mean, things look promising. Um, however, I do think, uh, you know, would a static website alone without the coach support be effective? I mean, if we're looking at the Swim C study, what we're hearing from participants is, is actually that coach support through the kind of the rather abstract and sometimes complex concepts of ACT is really needed. Um, so I think we can deliver these types of interventions online and we have done with previous therapies, but I do think the coach contact um, is important to help the participant talk and work through the sort of cognitive exercises that, um, that really underpin uh, ACT and, and behavior change. Yeah, I wonder in the future whether we might see a sort of um, psychological version of the Turing test where you know, <laughs> you could, whether you can distinguish the therapist from the computer, but no, we'll see about that. So, Paul, did you want to come off mute and ask your question? Yeah, it's it a more general question. Um, I think today with the bright sunshine, we're all hoping that this is going to mark the start to, of a return to, to the new normal. But from a, a research perspective, um, I think we're, we really want to ask is how new will the new normal be? Um, to what extent are the various techniques and technologies which are controlled in studies like SWIMC and Felon COVID-19 study um, already being incorporated into, into the design of, of future studies. And that's really for all the panelists, including Nick. Okay, let's start with uh, Kirsty, if you're ready to yeah. answer that one. Nicely um, prompted there, Paul. But um, we're already designing studies now from our learnings of this um, in, in specific patient groups. So I think though we think we're in a no new normal, I think it will be quite a while before we are back to new normal. And there are certain groups of patients that particularly may be more careful in the coming months, year, where um, coming into a clinical facility to do research isn't really what they're going to be wanting to do. Um, and we were already going towards this direction in, if we think about the NHS strategic plan, as Nick mentioned earlier with research for clinical there was already a drive to moving um, clinical practice and research to more digital. And I think about a year or a year and a half ago, I would have said, yeah, but it's quite a long way off. Maybe this has accelerated a direction that was already happening. And so I think it may continue that way. Sure. What do you think, Rebecca? Um, I think this uh, conducting studies online offers um, more uh, flexibility and accessibility to some populations in that, you know, you ju you're just removing the barrier and having to actually come in and do these kind of questionnaires or like uh, in person where you can do them online, particularly for weight management studies where a lot of services now are transitioning online anyway. So and one example would be um, the weight management company Oviva, which is now um, throughout Europe and the UK, they are primarily primarily based online. They have very little face-to-face -face, um, groups. So I think, like Kirsten said, things are moving that way anyway. And if, if we get the recruitment strategy right for harder to reach groups, I think actually um, we might be this um, this method of recruiting might actually help us to reach those groups um, perhaps more than face-to-face -face would. Okay, so we have a question from David Bauer about um, the cycle of of, of, the, of uh, research projects, and I think what he's what he's asking is, uh, has anything really benefited from COVID? Has this uh, changed anything in, in in a positive direction? And maybe I can chip in one thing before Kirsten and Rebecca answer. It, I think uh, the speed with which we set up studies and get them approved has changed considerably for the better. And I think there are uh, moves now to ensure that we don't go back to the days when those approval processes took a long time. I think that we'll have to wait to see if the pace can be kept up. But I think that is one thing that's really uh, improved. And Kirsten, did you have a, yeah, an I agree. example? And I think it's the, the speed of the data coming back. Though we used to have people come into a clinical facility, collect the data and so on, we've got the opportunity to get information in shorter bursts 
through this telehealth and I think people are more engaged with that now because we're used to that kind of thing more in our daily lives and it's meant that we can change questions as things go through um, as I gave the example you know that the testing came in and COVID vaccines came in and we were able to quickly adapt those into the app and get the, the answers straight through but it does generate an awful lot of data. Indeed. Becky? Yeah, and just to add to that, really, um, so in terms of refining the SWIM program, you know, it's a lot um, easier to book a Zoom call with the PPI group and the stakeholder groups than it is to get them all in a room in person. Um, so again, just just moving, you know, moving that along, that stage along on top of getting the data back quickly. And so um, that was probably the only the extra benefit. So quick question to both of you. So what do you what have you found? This is from um... DA Robinson online. What do you found are the challenges of engaging a diverse group of participants? I mean, we all worry about digital exclusion and other forms of exclusion. So what, what have you found are the challenges? Becky, do you want to go first? Yeah, so um, for us, it, the, the speed with which we had we had to adapt the intervention and get it up and running and then recruit into the trial meant that we didn't have the time really to um, delve into our recruitment strategy as much as we would like to. So if if we were doing it over again, we would probably spend some time building relationships, like I said, with those community champions and, and accessing those harder to reach groups. Um, and those participants who perhaps don't have access to a device, then perhaps some of their family members might be able to share a computer or device so that they could log on um, to do that once a week. So it, it's, yeah, I think just fostering, um, building those relationships before recruitment and, and making sure that we are accessing um, the right groups. Indeed. Kirsty? Um, just taking the example, the Finland cohort, actually reaching them in the first place. We started off um, at the time we, we couldn't get back into the offices to do um, mail outs. We started with email and text and that reached a certain group of people. But you could argue that some of us are bombarded with email constantly or text constantly, maybe don't reply to those so much. And then we got a different group of people when we sent a physical flyer to people. So I think in terms of engaging people, not always using technology to reach the people initially um, is something I certainly learned. Okay, and a final question to you, Kirsty, which is another potential benefit, I think, is, is it possible if, that some measures that we might have usually taken in a clinical facility, like blood pressure, for example, they might be more uh, representative of the phenomenon we're trying to assess, usual blood pressure, if they're measured by the participants at home rather than in an artificial facility like a clinical setting. I completely agree. In another study we've been doing in South Africa, we've done that and you see a big difference between what we call the white coat effect of coming in and having their blood pressure taken. The opportunity to have um, measurements at home that are uploaded via an app or other means could mean we could also get lots of repeated measures so first thing in the morning measures of in our case resting heart rate and temperature that may be a better representation than if you've rushed to a clinic to get your blood pressure taken later on in the day so yeah i think it's a really good opportunity for the future excellent well with that i'll draw the session to a close we're at eight o'clock i'd like to thank kirsten and rebecca for their presentations to thank Paul for his organization, but uh, most particularly thank you all for coming. So thank you very much and good night.